Okay, so having looked at some of those intrinsic cracks related to shrinkage, let's look at some thermal cracks. Now, one, one set, you know, this is again a massive concrete, right? Now, you can, you can see the cracks, possibly something like this, you know, you can see these cracks, some cracks here, this is the, okay, this is not easy, the pen shows those, the pen here. Now, these cracks is of a bridge pier, bridge pier, um, it is actually approach to the bridge, right? Now, the dimensions were too large, something like, you know, I exactly do not remember, but the width is 2 meter here and the span, you know, length is because of 6 lanes. So, I think it was a continuous, uh, if not continuous, but this width was not less than 2 meter, it was, width was more than that. So, depth is 2 meter, height is obviously high. Now, you see this such kind of a thick concrete volume to surface area ratio is very large. It is almost like mass concrete. The grade of concrete was I think 35 or 40 or something of that kind relatively high grade used a 53 grade of cement right used 53 grade of cement which actually produces more heat of hydration early and uh, the concrete grade was quite high so cement content was also very high. So, so, this developed this kind of thermal. So, thermal cracks do come in large structures, you know, where you have a, like a thick raft. Thin sections, usually you should be, one should be careful about shrinkage. Thick sections, very thick section, thermal cracks are the ones which are likely to come. So, this is what the case was. This is same, same place, same bridge. It is showing further cracks somewhere, you know, somewhere, uh, these are the piers. The other, you know, this is a this is a beam, which is supported uh, supported on piers. So this is the approach. Uh, this this is a this is a approach basically. Uh, uh, you know, this is a this is a approach, uh, uh, and then here the girders are supposed to come, but there are cracks. There are cracks, thermal cracks of this form. One of them, they filled it in with some sort of uh, yeah, some sort of uh, polymer modified system, uh, but. The main cause was a high, relatively higher grade concrete, relatively higher grade concrete with a high, you know, early strength cement, 53 grade, which should not have been the case, and heat of hydration resulted in such crack formation. So one has to be careful, you know, the the heat of hydration of the cement should be low. If you require strength, okay, and then the, you know. I mean the section, everything should be taken into account, the heat of hydration, the rate of strength development required and the structural requirement. So, I think here structural requirements were satisfied with the thickness. When it came to strength development, I am not sure because it was lying, you know, lying unloaded for so long time. That means the time, so time was not a constraint here. So, strength development was not a constraint, but then uh, the people, you know, I was told the structural designer insisted on 53 grade of cement and the high strength. So, actually that caused this sort of crack. Although these are intrinsic crack, but they have their long term effect anyway. So, this was the, this was the uh, cracks. So, case A and B early cracks, they were something of this kind. These are the vertical cracks we have seen between the kind of you know pilasters. I mean there are higher thickness case A and B as I was mentioning the shrinkage cracks earlier in the previous lecture. So, the they are between you know there are there are kind of buttresses you can say right extended section here. So, exactly near the center of this one because it is restrained here. This is shrinking, this is thicker do not shrink you know not allowing it and the cracks were almost equally spaced on in, in in each of this between between these two, uh, you know, between the two, two buttresses sort of thing. So this was the case A and B. Both A and B showed this. C showed this is the I was talking about the uh, segment, you know, 280 mm thickness. You can see the cracks, the red, blue, etc., etc., because we classified them. 
you know you can see the cracks like this there are a lot of cracks on this convex side there are nothing on the concave side so convex side there are plenty of cracks so basically these were since the cracks came they started doubting the segments you know segments uh, quality so they thought there could be one is the cracks but there are honeycomb somewhere you know once it is under scanner they scan they started looking into every detail so some places honeycomb and it's for an important structure as you can say it's a tunnel structure so uh, honeycomb cracks crazing curing they started looking at everything curing peeled off started looking at it and then they there is something like uh, 1511 segments were doubtful you know comprising of full 161 you know full 161 rings and some more part of the rings and all that so you see it was a huge number of them and the cost involved would be pretty high so the objective of this investigation was is then one had to formulate so visual survey was done then it was decided that you can group the cracks into five groups for example group 1 no observed cracks but honeycombing or damage during molding so then it's, it's, it, it would be treated in a different manner so honeycombing or damage during demolding so they can be treated in a different manner you know because while you are handling them there might be some corner broken and all and these are expected and therefore standard procedure one would lay down in contract sort of situation then some others they started doubting there were doubts because once it's under scanner everything is under scanner measurement sizes because it is precast element has to go to the right place so therefore there are measurements doubts were there also some of them third variety no observed cracks curing but then curing was not up to the mark you know it was felt that it peeled off early although the cracks didn't come then somewhere very surprisingly somewhere they use a curing water which had chloride so this is also you know it is an example how investigation uh, i mean the how, how the real situation comes into being so the case study explains the visual survey part is important here we'll come to the other parts later on anyway so post they they they, they, they use some chloride bearing water for curing and that's for they said that okay these are the set of segments where that water has been used which is not tested water possibly chloride bearing and therefore you know you, you have to investigate upon them also the last variety is the cracks observed observed cracks were observed and this variety was most important because we would like to keep the cracks away or rather either throw them away or repair them so since in the first case where you have honeycombing small honeycombing can always come depending upon several situations the mold oil has not been applied properly the you know the concrete is a bit dry compaction has not gone properly small honeycombing can come even in a uh, kind of a uh, casting yard which is by and large industrialized production as i mentioned uh, so there it was envisaged i mean it was seen earlier for, for seen earlier so standard procedure was laid down so group one those ones we said that you just follow the standard procedure and can be passed group two dimensional problem they had a control assembly system that means since it was tunnel segment so they had you know mock tunnel lining you know mock tunnel was there on the ground so control assembly so you have one segment next seg segment coming in six segments should be there one segments come in next segment comes in etc etc then there's a key segment last one so all the segments you put in position and if they are fitting in okay so your things are okay so this is con control assembly this is control assembly then since a uh, curing was improper uh, a little bit of some durability tests were necessary for those concrete and where chloride was uh, used for uh, you know curing so what was done is test for chloride at river level now you see it also gives you an idea what tests are selected and how it is selected for example there i just i am quite happy to select only durability related tests i don't i'm not going to look at the strength 
In this case, I will not do neither any durability test. I will take samples and measure the chloride. And if the chloride is within permissible limit, I am fine. If it is not, then you start, you know, you particular what then your additional test has to be done, right? Uh, maybe you have to do some protection so that there is already uh, internal chloride is there. So, either you, you know, you have to a decision has to be taken, but fortunately, in this particular case, when tested, none of the case showed chloride level high. You know, you can do chloride testing by uh, silver nitrate test, standard titration procedure is there, make powder, grind it, pass it to 150 mm, uh, 150 mm uh, um, sieve powder, dissolve it in if you are testing for free chloride dissolve it in distilled water for half an hour, take an extract of the you know, soluble chloride or if it is total chloride, I, I, I am not going into the details of this total and free chloride, but total chloride is even chemically bound chloride in the concrete system and that also get dissolved when you test it under 6 normal nitric, you know you saw dissolve it in 6 normal nitric acid. So, the grinded concrete powder then dissolved in 6 normal nitric acid, test for chloride by first you know adding silver nitrate and precipitate etcetera etcetera doing a titration you can find it out. So, fortunately in this case nothing showed up chloride. So, every you know it was all ok. Now, last one is the most important one because there are cracks observed. So, there was a you know you need to have test first of all the whether these cracks are acceptable or not, whether there is a problem related to strength every details we had to one or two find out. So, quantity of quality of concrete, durability and even strength was a requirement and depth of crack, you know how much is the depth of crack, whether it has gone through and through that is what was. So, first a visual survey diagnosis as I said we used this right. From the look of it we identify using the same, same diagram which I used earlier which I showed earlier we could diagnose that this is possibly drying shrinkage in thin section because 280 mm was the thickness and curing was not proper. So, drying would have occurred and the cracks did not come immediately within 48 hours or something and later on when one would put glass still telltale as it call it, it did not crack as if the cracks were all dead. So, therefore, from this we could looking at cracks everything first stage was we thought this was drying shrinkage cracks right because of poor curing scenario. So, there are some crazing and hairline cracks were also there we could see that. Now, crazings are defined as something less than 0 0.08 millimeter width right and this can be left unrepaired according to American concrete institute ACI you know guidelines and all that you can leave it on un, 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 you know it is 0 0.08 millimeter thickness. Uh, 8 percent of a millimeter thickness. So, you can see what small it is, but you can magnif you can measure them under magnifying glass and scale there are ways there are uh, uh, maybe maybe some class I will show you how crack can be measured uh, sometime I will show you. So, uh, you, you can you have scales actually through which you can measure and if it is less than that well it is it is you know it can be left unrepaired. For cracks greater than 0 0.8 millimeter, that was 0 0.08, and this is 0 0.8 millimeter. Essentially, you know, transfer of stress cracks, crack transfer of stress across the crack. That could be, may not be possible because if I have a crack, something of this kind, right? I apply load here. Now, if there's a gap is sufficiently large this load will not be transferred to the other side right. What causes this if there is interlocking of the aggregates even after crack then load will be transferred because through the interlock locks it will be transferred. So, it is the sand which protruding on sand allows crack I mean stress to be transferred. Therefore, 0 0.8 millimeter is the you know 0.8 millimeter is the uh, guidelines in existing structure if the crack is more than 0.8 millimeter then it you know you got to think about that there may not be a possibility of load transfer. So, accordingly one has to identify them you know identify them. So, 
identify the size of the crack according to their width. Crack width should be sufficiently small to protect the rebar from corrosion because if the crack progresses up to the rebar, something can come from outside, the moisture obviously and if there is any other things or even carbonation would follow that crack. So corrosion could be a thing and therefore you need some protection. Now that size is less than 0.3 millimeter right for moderate condition and all these are given in ACI 224 R90 guideline. So therefore we followed that by following that classify the cracks according to their width. No, not yet, not in Indian code. This is the best guideline because it is also based on a little bit of experience. right? So, we do not have Indian guidelines on existing structure, their crack width, how do we classify or where, what should. We have used this and I think it is a good, good one to use. After all, it is based on international experience. So, based on this, what was done was used a color coding, used a color coding for the cracks. All the cracks were mapped all over all the segments. This is an example how one does visual survey thoroughly, right? There are some more examples I might look into. So green, if the color is green, the crack is marked with green marker pen. You know, first all the all the elements were laid down with their convex side on the surface, the doubtful cracks, one by one, batch by batch, something like maybe 16, 8 or 16 you take today, look at them mark them and then identify etc etc green color means width less than 0.08 mm this you know is as i said we can measure them i'll next time i think i'll bring that and i'll show you there's a small scale but there are better methods of then measurements them also crack width measurement blue color between 08 to 0.2 millimeter actually 0.3 could have been there but we decided to put it into 0.2 and 0.4 red double black is 0 0.4 to 0.8 and double red is so two red lines would show that the crack is more than 0 0.8 millimeter which means that stresses transfer for such a segment could be problematic you know if the stress comes on one side of the uh, segment may not the other side may not be uh, you know they will act independently so effective size of the crack for stress transfer might be uh, reduced so that's why it was you know color coding was done in this manner and this is how somebody is doing it, visual inspection has been done, is being done and this shows the color coding. You can see that these are all blue, this is blue, this is red, single line red, blue color, blue, red, some would be green, double red perhaps were not there at all. You know, you can see that there is a red, fine red line going on above my red marked red line. These are all blue mark, you can see that. So, all cracks were actually color coded and marked right and then tests were suggested you now the tests are first because you know strength was not a serious issue but we definitely wanted to look into the quality of concrete so two tests which we'll describe sometime later on a hardness test called rebound hammer test and this is the ultrasonic pulse velocity test and core test was done to look at the strength for some of the cores at least which are actually badly damaged you know which I can't use because I am damaging the core by making the you know cutting the cores. So we do we, you know we try to establish the strength somewhere from uh, those kind of because after all the concrete is same. So that's what it is. Then we one would place, you know, it was actually telltale strips were placed. That is, that I think the diagram is there. Perhaps the diagram is there. Not here, it is not the diagram is here. Okay. So, you, you put a glass strip, small glass strip around that, small glass strip, you know, put a small glass strip around here on both sides of the crack. Now, after some time, if this strips, you know, this glass strip is nothing, the kind of uh, uh, thin about 2 millimeter or 3 millimeter thick glass rectangular piece maybe about 8 to 10 centimeter 8 centimeter or so 80 mm and this side may be about 25 mm or 20 mm rectangular piece bonded here 
with epoxy or something on both sides of the crack. And if the crack is live, that is, it's expanding, then grass being brittle, and if this bond is proper, it will show up the crack after some time. So, this is standard procedure followed to find out whether a crack is live or it is dormant. You know, it's not, it's not really expanding, dead or dormant as we call it. So, this is, this was put in, in many of them, especially the wood where we, you know, red ones surely because we thought that might increase. Uh, so, that's, that's what was, that's what was done. This is a one test and not only that, since during handling the, there can be problem. So, this segments were mock handled after putting those glass, they were taken by the crane and taken to the stacking yard and put them there. So, if you take to the stacking yard, there is a handling or load to the truck. So, a mock handling was done and seen during the mock handling process did it crack. Then this is, this is of course the test. Then of course, test for uniformity and strength as I said. Then progress of crack was done this and also crack depth through ultrasonic pulse velocity. Now, this I will explain sometime later on because once I explain ultrasonic pulse velocity test itself, you can measure crack depth to that. But there are other methods of measuring crack depth as well. Today, there are other methods available, but this you can you can use this to find out the crack depth. We will see that, right. Then some of those segments, you know, on some of the segments we wanted to do some durability test. So, which are in situ. So, what you do is on the segment itself, um, one can do initial surface absorption test. Again, I will describe this sometime later on. Again, I will talk about this sometime later on, right, because I have not mentioned what is ISAT test. Some permeation quality test. Absorption test would require a sample of core to be taken, BS absorption test or EN, it is now EN. So, absorption test will require some code to be taken. So, we are avoiding code taking, but ISAT and some other permeability test one could have done. So, this is an example of how one goes about visual inspection and then follows up some test. Maybe some more of it will come, not exactly because some cases I have discussed. One case I discussed elaborately because it is an important case where we looked into several things. So, this also tells you how one can go about uh, you know investigating. Now, the visual survey alkali aggregate reaction, basically alkali aggregate reaction involves some silica which forms H, this acid you know silica in some aggregates right and they can react to the alkalis of cement, sodium hydroxide and potassium hydroxide. So, we you know we can, it can react, I mean I am not interested in the reaction part of it, but what I am interested in oh, how the cracks will look like. Now, this is from literature, typical alkali aggregate reaction cracks would look something like this, they will look something like this right, alkali aggregate reaction would look like this. And they might appear from large aggregate here. So, typical alkali aggregate cracks, what is called map cracking, you might see. And if you delay it for quite some time, some chunks might even come out. Now, uh, yeah, this one is a real case of an alkali aggregate reaction in Indian scenario, northeast, you know, after some time, say basically. Uh, a support for tower, support for tower, right. So, they used aggregates which were not tested really because they finished off their earlier aggregates and it gave up cracks of this kind. So, they are not very sure why it has happened. Well, uh, you know somebody can jolly well diagnose it as uh, possibly because of load that can, but load internal pressure was, you know there will be no internal pressure. If I put some load onto a pedestal, you know it would bulge along, along this direction. So, I will have cracks, but why horizontal cracks? So, this was actually you know you have to use your common sense of load flow as well. Visualize how the load flow is taking place. So, this was an cracks which came after about 10 years in service. So, because they use an aggregate and this this is an example of alkali aggregate reaction. Now, how do I so I am so confirmed? Because we, when we take out the aggregate from the same one, 
I find the aggregate and then the white alkali silica gel. Silica gels were silica gels were very much there, right? And uh, many other parts of the structures where the cracks were not so much, one can see cracks like this. One can see map cracking all over the place. You know, all over the place the cracks. So this was a case of an alkali because of some of the piers. It was piers of tower supporting structures. Well, well, this is well. This is well. That was the pedestal. So they used aggregates which were not really tested over time and did not do test for alkali aggregate reaction. You will see white patches like this and you, there are other additional tests to take the samples. Chemical tests you can do or petrographic analysis you can do to find out on those aggregates what are the minerals present. So alkali aggregate reactions can be identified in this way. These are some examples of alkali aggregate reaction uh, abroad from literature only. So visual observation is important. If you see this you can actually find out and uh, this, is, this is what alkali aggregate reactions would look like, some of them, right? Now, freestyle effect is not very common in India, but uh, this is how one it might look. Freestyle effect might look something like this, some pop out, some pop out here, scaling somewhere, you know. So freestyle effect is because of the ice occupies more volume than water. So in a saturated concrete, if it freezes, exerts pressure, ice exerts pressure internally and this can result in sort of uh, uh, you know internal pressure generation and over the years after many cycles. I do not think I will go into the concrete science of it at the moment, but freestyle effect can also be identified kind of propping, popping that you see, pop out concrete, scale you know cracks etc. etc. from the surface surface deterioration you can actually find out. Yeah. So similarly corrosion, typically corrosion would look like this. Rebar corrosion would look like this. I showed one example. Initially it is like this, then rust to rust product will occupy the surrounding, exhaust pressure and finally the crack comes like this. And results would be something like this. Beams you will see like cracks parallel to the rain bar like this. Sometime or later it will simply spall off. In slabs you may not see in the beginning but see a sagging and then it will come out like this. Mm -hmm.